Welcome back to GardenWise Adventures. My name is Malie, and today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about per permaculture. Now, permaculture is something that I've been interested in, you know, mostly to see what it's about and see if there's any of the design elements in it that I could use in my garden. And what I've been doing is I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos and reading this book, uh, Gaia's Garden. I've been reading other sources too, but this one has been really interesting to me. It's by Toby Hemingway and it's been very interesting. So this is gonna be a series of videos. And in this first video, I just kind of wanted to go over what permaculture is and what the principles are about permaculture that I think are really interesting and some of them are very useful. So what is permaculture? Now, according to Bill Mollison, who was like the founder of permaculture, um, it looks like they say that uh, Permaculture is principles that are used to design ecologically sound, productive landscapes and ones that are sustainable in their use. Now, what does sustainable mean? You know, it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but to me, it means something that will continue to be productive. I can't say without inputs because my property definitely would not be able to be sustained without inputs. It would turn back into the desert, but with the least amount of inputs as possible, which I like because that means less work. Less work to me is more fun. So I'm actually just going to take everything from uh, the first chapter in this book. You know, what are permaculture principles? Now I find that these principles are very useful and there's different elements of permaculture that we're going to talk about later. Some are useful and some are not as useful in my area. Now the first per permaculture principle that I wanted to go over is observe. It says use protracted and thoughtful observation rather than prolonged and thoughtless action. And I kind of wanted to take you through my garden and show you how that principle has been very useful in planning my yard. Okay now as you look at my yard you can kind of see that we have a heavy slope. We are also, my house is also up against the Wasatch Mountains, which is part of the Rocky Mountain Range. We're in zone six. Normally I counted as, as six. Well, actually normally, you know, for a long time I counted it as a zone five. Um, it is now probably closer to a zone six. Some winters like this winter, we're closer to even a zone eight. But as you look at my yard, and realize that it's on a slope. If you understand how cold air works, you know that cold air sinks and finds the lowest points. So that is the, one of the first things that I observed about my landscape and thought, okay, if cold air is sinking, where do I want to plant things like tomatoes and cucumbers? So we looked up at the top of this hill. We realized this is a west facing hill. This is the west. We've got the sun setting over here. Then we've got the south over this way. And I realized this hill was the perfect place to put a garden. And especially we needed to put the warmer crops up at the top, the crops that needed warmth. The other thing that I realized is that all the cold air is going to be draining past this area. We're going to get a lot of sun and we are going to be able to get rosemary to flourish in this area. So observation is very important in permaculture principles and it's been very important in planning my landscape design. Now understand that observation is not a quick thing. It's a continuous learning process and you need to observe a property for quite a while you know, look at it, you know, even for a full season, look at it in the spring, in the summer, in the winter, in the fall, and you'll see different changes that may influence your planting decisions. So I love the idea that permaculture includes observation as its number one. The second principle that I really like is called, it says connect. Number two, connect. Use relative location, that is place the elements of your design in ways that create useful relationships. Now, Relationships, sorry about the wind, relationships in landscape design have always been very important to me. There are certain plants, you know, I'm not about companion planting. Companion planting scientifically has been chosen to not really actually make a difference. But there are certain things that you can plant together to make a difference and I wanted to show you some of that in my garden. 
Okay, so one, one of the relationships I wanted to show you is this hilltop that I have in the back of my property. This hilltop is covered by a bunch of different plants and it is very self-sustaining. I don't have to prune a lot. Every once in a while I'll have to go in there and pull out a rogue sapling. But it's because of the relationships of the plants that are in here, that's what's helped make this hilltop successful. So the first thing that you notice is there's a ton of juniper. Now this hill only gets watered by drip once or twice a week. We also have a house behind here that you can't see. The useful one blocking the view of the other house so that you kind of feel like this is a private area. But the junipers are very drought tolerant. They can handle drought, they can handle a little bit of water. You know, if the neighbors are watering too much, you know, that's not gonna kill them. Every plant here can tolerate any condition, any of the conditions that will happen on this hillside. The junipers also shade the ground and they seem to hold the moisture in for the trees. The trees have never had drought stress, no matter how dry this hill has gotten. And I think that these junipers are helping shade the soil a little bit, along with my least favorite, but I leave it anyway. This is a creeping euonymus. That covers the hillside in the open areas where the juniper hasn't covered. And it also helps shade the hill. It holds the mulch in place and it also stops erosion. Now, one of the things, you know, when I first bought this house, you, as you can see way up there, and you've seen probably on my other videos, you can see little bits of open area and there's weed mat under here. Um, the weed mat was too hard to remove when I moved in, so I have not removed it. That also, though, helps stop erosion on this hillside. Now, if you look back here, you'll see that I have an ivory halo dogwood. Dogwoods like a little bit of shade, and the trees and the lilac and everything around it is helping supply some of the shade that, it's ne that it needs. So there's the relationships there. Now through here, you're gonna see what looks like a lot of weeds. Now each of these plants, I think, help build relationships in the garden. All of these through here, and I'll probably come in and thin some out and use them in salads, but these are dill. Over here, we have and oh my heavens, I have completely lost, I'll, I'll put it up on the screen. The wind has taken all my brain cells and blown them away, and I can't remember the name of this plant. But as you can see, it's flowering right now. The dill flowers, this plant flowers. I leave lettuce, you know, I let lettuce grow in between planting beds and flower. And all of these bring in pollinators. So they are very necessary to help pollinate the rest of the garden. The other thing that they bring in is they also bring in the beneficial insects like the parasitic wasps, the um, hoverflies. Hoverflies and parasitic wasps love these. For that reason, I also let cosmos come up. Now, I don't know if it's going to come up this year because it was a dry winter, and if it doesn't come up, I'll probably plant some more. But cosmos also brings in all of the beneficial insects, and they bloom later in the year, so it fills in the gaps when the dill and the... Um, the other plants aren't blooming. Right here you can see a little relationship going on through here. Rosemary is, is pretty tender in my area. So we have the fence right here that breaks up the wind so the cold wind does not hit my garden very much. Matter of fact, we had 40 miles an hour, 40 mile an hour winds with my cold frame left like this and nothing happened to it. It didn't even come apart a little bit. The plastic wasn't flapping around. It's because that fence breaks up the wind. This tree helps shade the soil so that a little bit of moisture stays in here. This rosemary gets very little water. Now I did hand water it over the winter because we had no moisture, but there's no irrigation on this rosemary. And it survives really well because its roots are shaded by this globe blue spruce. There's another relationship right there. Now the next design principle is catch and store energy. Now I talked a little bit in the beginning about how cold air flows and how I can use that. Now the cold air, the wind, you know, I talked about how the fence blocks the wind. We talked a little bit about how to catch and store energy in those ways. Now we get very little rain here in Utah, but if I wanted to, I could put water catchment systems on each of my downspouts and catch that energy. 
Um, I have not done that yet. I don't know if I'm going to do it. But that's another way to use that, uh, the principle of store and catch energy. Now the next principle is each element performs multiple functions. Now, what is an element? You know, I have elements of my garden beds. You know, if I had a rain catchment system, that would be another element. Um, we're gonna cover swales and what I think about swales in dry areas. You know, swales is another way to catch energy and that's another element. But each element that you have can have multiple functions. You know, water catchment system could control one runoff and it can also store water to water your plants. Your, my garden beds, they can function, they can have multiple functions. You know, some of the plants that are grown in there are for food, they draw in beneficials, and they feed pollinators. So there's multiple functions there. So I love that idea. And I try to plant my landscape using that principle. And I've done that for a long, long time. Every plant that I plant, I think about it. You know, my lilacs, they are visually stunning. And they also fill the yard with a wonderful scent. And that's a mood enhancer for me. So they can help improve my mood and they can be beautiful. And they're a good place for the birds to hide. A lot of songbirds like bushes to hide in so that they can escape predators and it helps improve the habitat for birds in my yard. So there's multiple functions just for a lilac tree. Now the next one, the next principle is pretty much the same. It says each function can have multiple elements. So to block wind, you know, we can have my fence that blocks wind. Um, to block the wind, we also have plants along the fence. In the areas where there is not a fence, we can put different plants of varying heights to block the wind. So each function, you know, if you want to block the wind, if you want to capture rainwater, there are multiple elements that can do the same thing. Now, another principle that I love says create the least change for the greatest effect. So let's say, you know, right here, we're underneath my jujube tree. I'm not getting much light to the plants that are under it. What I can do, instead of removing the entire tree, I can remove very specifically placed branches in the tree to increase the light. You know, don't go for removing the whole tree, remove strategic branches to bring in the light. Um, if I want to hold water better, instead of adding a whole new drip line, maybe what I can do is build little tiny berms. We'll go into swales and berms, you know, a little bit later. And I'm, you know, they're not extremely useful, I think, in my area. But in my garden beds with the irrigation, those little berms can help direct overflow water to plants that need it. So rather than, you know, do the huge change and put in more irrigation, you can just change the contour of the land just a little bit and direct the water to where you need it. So there's a little change creating a big benefit. Now, another element that I like that I haven't used as much is it says use small scale systems starting at your doorstep. You know, it says create your garden in chunks. What I really like about that is a lot of people, you know, and I, I did it here too, but what a lot of people will do is I'll say, I want a garden in a gorgeous landscape and put it all in once and immediately get overwhelmed. You know, like with my compost system, that, I mean, it's pretty effective for the fall leaves and everything like that. But for food scraps, it's too far away. What I needed to do is have a compost system that was closer to my kitchen. That way it becomes a lot more effective. The food that you eat and use the most, you have herb pots near your door and then expand out. The things that you use the least need to be further away. So I really do like that idea, even though I haven't used it in my own yard. Now, another design system that I didn't think I was using as well, but as I look at my property, I've used it more than I thought. It's called design around the edge. Use the edges of your property. They say the edges are the greatest accumulators and where things change the most. So let's go look at the edges of my property and see how I've kind of used those. Now, as we look at the front of my property, the front edge is just a sidewalk. You know, I don't see how this can be extremely useful other than it's a place that leads to my front door. By the time I finish redesigning my front yard, what I hope to use this front edge for is as a welcome to my home. Now, as we go around this side, this edge, you can see that it's been densely planted. Now, I'm on the north side of my property and the winds generally come through here from the north. Now, if you look way down at the end of the street, there's open fields and we get piles of tumbleweeds that come and they get caught along the edge here. 
So these plants along the edge, number one, they create kind of a barrier for the wind. They create a barrier for the tumbleweeds that come through. And it's also just kind of a visual end to my property. Now I took my fencing all the way to the sidewalk. In my area, this fence has to be slatted if it goes all the way to the sidewalk. So to create privacy and along the edge, just kind of also a frame for the property, I planted my grapes. So this edge has become very useful. Now there are a couple of more principles that I'm not going to cover. One's called collaborating with succession, that plants go from young to mature and that you've got to plan for that. Now the last principle that I'm not going to really go over in detail is use biological and renewable resources. And that's, you know, as everybody knows, that's really important in this day and age. You know, compost is one of the things that I do with that. So anyway, I'm glad you are along with this journey. So next time I think we're gonna cover swales. We're gonna cover some of the elements that are used in permaculture and which ones I feel are useful and which ones aren't, in my area at least. Because I can't say that there are systems that are not useful across the board. I think every property is gonna have its own needs. So anyway, I hope you join me for the next video and I hope you have a wonderful garden adventure. Mm -hmm.